when you talk about an exercise session, one isolated single exercise session, there are two factors to consider. Intensity factor. And the duration factor. Duration is the amount of time spent training. And intensity refers to the percentage of momentary effort. And this term intensity tends to be misunderstood. Some people think that by increasing the duration of their workouts, they're increasing the intensity, which is ridiculous. It's just the opposite. Every time you increase the duration, you have to decrease the intensity. These two things exist inversely in each other. They're mutually exclusive. You can't have a lot of one and a lot of the other. It's demonstrated by a very simple inverse ratio graph demonstrates the universal relationship that exists between intensity and duration. This is not a brainchild of Mike Mentzer. This is the basic law of physics. Universal principle. It applies to all activities, not just weight training. Chopping down trees, studying books, sex, whatever. The more intensely you do something, whenever the intensity increases a little bit, the duration has to decrease a lot. If you want to build big muscles fast, then you've got to train as intensely as possible. Because that is the one factor most responsible for building mass. And if you want to build mass, you've got to train for short periods so you can train intensely. That's the nature of the relationship. You can train either hard or you can train long, but you can't train hard and long. It's impossible. Not because I say you can't, but because it's impossible. Is there anybody who just like it's impossible to train hard for two hours? Nobody can train really hard. When I talk about hard, I mean maximally. All out effort for two hours. If you train as hard as you possibly can each and every set, then the majority of you in here cannot train in 30 minutes. I'm talking about as hard as you possibly can. Every set to total failure with minimal rest in between sets. Just enough rest between sets so you can go to your next set, resume your next set, and go to muscular failure as opposed to cardiovascular failure. That is not rush so fast that your cardiovascular system becomes the limiting system you want to go to muscular failure. If you do that, you will probably not train in 30 minutes. How long do I get to train in 30 seconds? It doesn't matter. It's going to vary from muscle group to muscle group because of the demands placed on the cardiovascular system. You rest just long enough between sets so you can resume the next set and go to muscular failure as opposed to cardiovascular failure. In other words, if you're doing your legs and you're just going from one set to another, and the second set terminates because you're breathing so hard, as opposed to true muscular failure in the legs, then you didn't rest long enough. See what I'm saying? Any questions about this? It's really not, it's not even debatable. Like Robert Kennedy said in his nice editorial, it's fact, not theory. It's immutable. I mean, this is one of the basic laws of nature. You ever compare the calves of a sprinter to the calves of a distance runner? I use this example all the time, but it's one of the best there is. The sprinter always has a large muscular calf. The sprinter always has, or the distance runner always has a stringy little calf. Because the overtraining is chronically overtraining. And I would venture to say the majority of bodybuilders top bodybuilders today who are training over two hours a day would look like distance runners if they weren't taking steroids. They're so grossly overtrained. You just cannot recover from that much training. We talked about it earlier. During the demonstration phase of the seminar, what's the first thing your body has to do after the workout? You stimulate growth first, hopefully. If you train hard enough, and stimulated growth, you will grow, but what has to happen first of all? Recover. Recover. If you allow enough time for recovery, then you have to allow enough time for growth. If you do those three things, stimulate growth, number one, 
allow enough time for recovery. It does take time, up to 48 hours in some cases, depending upon the severity of the exercise and the volume of the exercise. Then another block of time is required for that growth to manifest itself. Growth never precedes recovery. Recovery always comes first. You don't need a 21-inch arm to survive, but you do, you do need to continually recover and replace your precious physical resources and reserves. If you didn't continually recover from exercise, obviously you would die very rapidly, very soon. You've got to stimulate growth first through high-intensity training, allow enough time for recovery, and then allow enough time for, for growth. If you train, again, before recovery takes place, then the growth process can't take place. Because now you've got to recover from that next workout again. If you allow enough time for recovery to take place, but not enough time for growth to take place, you still won't grow. It takes time to recover and it takes time to grow. So I'm saying you should rest from anywhere 48 to 72 hours, to two, 72 hours between workouts. Six day a week training is always a mistake for the purpose of building muscular mass. If you want to build definition or create definition, then you can't be active enough. Train every day, all day, whatever you want to do. If you're training, if you're volume first, yeah. you're, you're not I'm not talking about local, localized muscle recovery. I'm talking about recovery of the physical system as a whole. Localized muscle recovery actually takes place very rapidly. But you do 10 sets of squats, very, very heavy squats on Monday. Your legs may have recovered by Tuesday, but try to do a heavy back workout on Tuesday. You won't feel the inclination. Because your whole system has been called upon. Demands have been made upon all the body's recuperative substances. Not just the leg. The whole system is called upon. You've got to allow the whole body to recover, not just the legs.